The Travel Show, sponsored by Turkish Airlines. Hello, I'm Nuala McGovern and you're watching The Context on BBC News. On the eve of Ukraine's Independence Day and the six-month anniversary since Russia's invasion, there are growing concerns of a nuclear disaster. With fighting continuing near Europe's biggest nuclear plant, inspectors are trying to organise an urgent visit to the site at Zaporizhia. Germany looks to Canada to fill its energy needs as it turns its back on Russian fuel. Rubbish reviews at the Edinburgh Festival as the week-long waste workers strike could now extend across Scotland. Tonight, with the context, Jim Murphy, former leader of the Scottish Labour Party and former senior advisor to George W. Bush, Ron Christie. Welcome to the programme. Well, we're going to start in Ukraine tonight on the eve of a serious and significant day. August 24th marks both the Ukrainian Independence Day and the six months since Russia launched its invasion of the Eastern European country. Independence Day usually is filled with celebrations. Not this year. In the capital, Kyiv, public events have been banned for safety reasons. And today, leaders of dozens of countries and international organisations took part in the Crimea platform, a summit to reassert their support for Ukraine. Let's listen to French President Emmanuel Macron. We cannot have any weakness in the face of this, no show of compromising behaviour, because this is about everyone's freedom and about peace in all parts of the world. Well, undoubtedly, one of the big topics up for discussion was the situation at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. So the facility is the largest of its kind in Europe. It was taken by Russian forces shortly after the start of the war, but it remains run by Ukrainian staff. Now, both Ukraine and Russia have traded accusations over shellings in the Zaporizhia region. As the conflict has come dangerously close to the facility, there have been calls for a demilitarised zone to be established. The UN nuclear watchdog, the International Atomic Energy Agency, or the IAEA, has long raised concerns about nearby shelling. Earlier this month, Director General Rafael Grossi warned the situation could spiral even more out of control and that the IAEA's presence was of paramount importance. Now it seems there's been some movement. Today, Mr Grossi told the BBC that he expects to personally lead a mission to the plant within days, not weeks. We have many concerns. We have many concerns. And we are going to try to look into every single one of those. Well, Mr Grossi said these concerns include the integrity of the plant, whether or not it's been compromised, the functionality of the safety systems of the plant and if any repairs are needed. Also of great importance, the external power supply. Mr Grossi warned of the dangers if there's an interruption to supply. And he also wants to speak to staff with allegations of physical violence at the Zaporizhia site. I will be demanding that I have opportunities to discuss with staff, with all staff present there. And we have, of course, the vast majority is the, is the Ukrainian operators from the plant. Uh, but there are also Russian experts there. So I will be talking to, to, to everybody and trying to, to uh, ascertain the, the, the situation and make uh, the necessary recommendations. Now, the UN Security Council is currently holding an emergency meeting to discuss that situation in Zaporizhia. Russia claimed it had supported IAEA efforts since day one. It says it had done all it could for inspectors to visit in June. At the time, the, the trip did not happen through no fault of our own. Today, we hear absurd statements in foreign uh, mass media that the foreign countries basically pushed Russia to agree to the mission. 
So what is the real and present danger of the Zaporizhian nuclear plant? Well, to discuss it, I'm joined by Dr. Edwin Lyman. He's a physicist, also director for the Nuclear Power Safety at the Union of Concerned Scientists. You're very welcome to the context. I'm just wondering what you think uh, of Mr. Grossi's comments there. I was particularly intrigued. He says, you know, he wants to go in and see if there's any, um, I suppose, red flags to the safety and security of the plant. What would he, in like real terms, be looking for walking around? Well, the first thing he would look for is the actual physical damage to the plant. And so far, the IE has only been able to uh, hear what the Ukrainians have had to say about the damage. But there needs to be an independent evaluation uh, by, by an external expert. So obviously, if there's any uh, infrastructure damage to either the uh, reactor buildings, to the electrical uh, supply systems, or to other safety uh, significant parts of the plant, that is something that, um, that's important to know. But also critical, as Mr. Grossi pointed out, is the need to assess the state of the personnel at the plant. The Ukrainian personnel running the plant who are under the gun by the Russian occupiers and whether they can actually uh, carry out their duties, uh, not only under ordinary conditions, but also in the event of a crisis. Do you think he'll be able to speak to staff freely as he hopes to? Well, one would hope that uh, they would negotiate uh, the ability to do that because this, this visit is not going to be very useful if it's completely stage managed by the Russians. The IAEA needs to be able to independently evaluate and uh, the uh, status of the staff, their mindset, and of course, the, the, uh, that will be very difficult to do because they are under great pressure and at the risk of uh, their health and safety and, and their lives. So, uh, and just coming back to that aspect of him walking around hopefully freely, I know he thinks and not stage managed as, as you mentioned, um, is it getting into certain parts of that power plant? Is it the infrastructure of it? What is it uh, in real concrete terms of what he will be looking for? Well, I, I do think that assessing the integrity of the uh, electrical systems, uh, we heard that there was, uh, there was damage to a transformer uh, due to shelling that severed the connection to a fossil fuel plant, which is one of the important backup power supplies to the plant. Um, also, I think it's very important to look at the emergency equipment. In the event that the plant does lose all its electrical power, it's going to have to rely on backup power, uh, diesel generators and other equipment. And that equipment also has to be in good working order. So I think it's very important for the IEA to assess whether those um, backup systems will be available. And if not, they need to be repaired and uh, fully supplied. They require uh, diesel fuel and there needs to be an ample supply of diesel. Yeah, interesting. Let's stay with us. Jim, what do you think about this? Do you think uh, Mr. Grossi or his colleagues from the IAEA could be seen as a neutral observer? Well, uh, it's difficult in a contest between a fire and a house fire to be neutral. Um, there's no such thing as neutrality when it comes to good versus evil. And without simplifying things too much, that's a degree of what we're seeing in Ukraine, the sort of mili militarised sense of dogmatism um, encroaching and enforcing, trying to enforce their will upon a democratic neighbour. So uh, it's, I think what will be important um, for D Mr Grozzi will be the idea that the people that he meets are also free of intimidation, mm. that they don't have chaperones, that their words aren't controlled, that their family members aren't threatened and that it ends up being an entire charade. And I think Mr. Grozzi will have to be very live to that indeed. Yeah, it's a difficult one, isn't it? Um, Ron, you know, this aspect they talked about of a, a DMZ, like a demilitarized zone, do you think that could be workable, uh, looking at what has happened so far between Russia and Ukraine? Uh, good evening to you, Noah. No, I don't. I, first of all, we have to recognize that the Russian Federation has invaded a democratic country, and they are killing people and they are occupying this territory. So in my view, the notion of having a de demilitarized zone around this plant, um, you're going to have the Russians on all sides. And, and I worry about this visit. 
um, from the IAEA of, you know, they might very well be in a hostage-like situation, right? I mean, don't say anything to the UN because we might come after your family, we might come after you. So I just wonder about the efficacy of it. I think it's important to do, no question, but I just wonder if the candor will be there that we all would hope and expect. Mm, so it doesn't sound that hopeful uh, speaking to you, Ron, or indeed Jim. Um, but coming back to you, Edwin, um, he will recommend, Mr. Grossi, what he believes should happen. But they're just recommendations, right? He has no actual power. Unfortunately, that's true. The IAEA has no legal authority when it comes to nuclear safety. All they can do is make recommendations. And even in peacetime, uh, they, um, they don't have any ability to enforce those recommendations. Here, in, in this situation, they have even less authority. But what they can do is report uh, fairly uh, the situation at the plant and try to build up the uh, political support from the entire international community to take stronger action to prevent an atrocity from occurring at Zaporizhia that could lead to a large release of radioactivity, not only contaminating Ukraine, uh, their agriculture, their water supplies, but also potentially um, Western Europe and the Middle East. Uh, that mm. does sound, uh, of course, disastrous. Uh, just briefly, Edwin, before I let you go, is there any other situation like this that comes to your mind historically? There has been no situation of this comparable gravity involving a nuclear power plant in the midst of, of uh, uh, a conflict, but especially being used as a, a shield, as the Russians are doing, and almost provoking uh, Ukraine uh, from, from that shield. So, so, so I think we're in uncharted territory here, uh, but the lessons that come out of it are going to have to be applied in the future when we think about the future of nuclear power, especially in areas of political instability. Mm. Edwin Lyman, thanks so much for your analysis. Thank you. Well, the war in Ukraine has put a strain, as we're hearing there, on the world's energy markets, particularly in Europe, where many countries that were heavily reliant on Russian gas and oil to power their economies, they're now searching for alternative suppliers. Germany is one of those countries. And since the start of the war, Germany has reduced its dependence on Russian oil from 35 to 12 percent and on Russian gas from 55 to 35 percent. Now today, Chancellor Olaf Scholz launched a new energy partnership with Canada. He's on a three-day trip to the country and has agreed a deal with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, you see there, to import liquid natural gas, LNG, and also large quantities of sustainable hydrogen power from Canada. As Germany is moving away from Russian energy at warp speed, Canada is our partner of choice. For now, this means increasing our LNG imports. We hope that Canadian LNG will play a major role in this. But the task at hand is much bigger than simply diversifying our energy supply. Germany has decided to become climate neutral by 2045. And at the same time, we are determined to remain a world leading industrialized country. So we have set ourselves clear and firm goals producing 80% of our electricity from renewables by 2030 is one of these. So why Canada? Well, first of all, Canada has a lot of natural gas in its reserves, more than 18 years worth of supply at its current usage. But because Canada lacks coastal export facilities, nearly all of its oil and gas goes to one market, you can guess it, the United States. Now, Prime Minister Trudeau has said getting Canadian gas to Europe is doable but it will need strong business investments to get things moving. And Germany is also very interested in Canada's hydrogen energy, and in particular, it's green hydrogen. So green hydrogen is produced by using electricity from renewable power to split water into hydrogen and oxygen molecules using an electrolyzer. It's then stored and can be used to power homes. Canada is currently home to the world's largest green hydrogen plant and has a number of other major green hydrogen projects in the works. Matthew Klippenstein is the regional manager for Western Canada for the Canadian Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Association, so perfectly placed to speak to us today. Uh, great to have you with us. Now, my understanding is that not all hydrogen uh, is created equal. I was reading about grey hydrogen, blue hydrogen, green hydrogen. But what a lot of people seem to agree on, whatever the hydrogen, the cost is very high. Do you think this is doable for Germany to begin to get its energy from Canada? 
I, I do believe it is doable. Canada has a, a wealth of renewable energy. I worked in the sector for some years. And at the moment, our, because we don't have a trans-Pacific or a transatlantic electric transmission line, that renewable energy is landlocked. Uh, this hydrogen to ammonia uh, to Germany approach would allow us to take some of those inexpensive uh, renewable electricity resources and then uh, help our, uh, our European um, uh, neighbours with that. But how would that go? In a gas on ships? Oh, OK, yes. Yeah. So uh, as you pointed out, uh, with an electrolyzer, you can take electricity, in this case made from new additional wind projects. These projects would then generate hydrogen, which would be reacted with nitrogen to form ammonia. Ammonia is the second largest industrial, uh, second largest traded industrial commodity worldwide. So it's a, it's a very mature sector. And so the hydrogen would be turned into ammonia, which would be stored as a liquid uh, on ships, and those would move across the Atlantic Ocean. But that infrastructure isn't there yet, right? And I'm just wondering, what would it take to make that happen and also what sort of timeline because of course this comes with the context of the war in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Yes, so um, new projects, infrastructure projects do take some time. Now, in, in the case of, say, if we tried to liquefy the hydrogen and move that, there is, I believe, one project worldwide, very small one, which is attempting to prove this out. Again, with the ammonia, it is a mature uh, industrial traded commodity. The know-how to establish terminals, uh, reactor vessels and terminals, is well established. But as you noted, it does take time. Um, unfortunately, uh, it, it would be difficult for us uh, not having uh, export terminals uh, for any, um, any of the energy sources uh, Germany had identified. We wouldn't be able to help them in the immediate term. This is more towards a middle and a long term uh, assistance and a mutually prosperous trade. What is middle and long term in, in, I don't know, months, years? Sure. So I believe the initial wind farm, the goal, it is an aggressive goal, is to have it up and running by 2024. Uh, this would involve uh, many things happening at once. We do want to make sure that uh, the, the local communities, the affected communities and our indigenous First Nations, uh, that Canada and the climate all benefit here. So perhaps a mid-decade non-committal as to the actual year uh, might be the prudent bet. Huh. Uh, well, lots of food for thought there. Stay with us. Um, when you hear about this, Ron, what do you think about this uh, announcement? Interesting where you're placed because Canada, of course, has been serving uh, the US, but now looking towards Europe. Well, I think our neighbours to the north uh, are a little upset with us. You'll remember uh, immediately upon assuming office that President Biden cancelled the Keystone Pipeline. Um, Prime Minister Trudeau was apparently taken aback by that and began to look for other sources, other um, trading partners, if you will, um, to trade energy. And I think he's found one in Germany. I think it will take a couple of years. Uh, they were saying if we had actually had Keystone that it, it might be operational about now, maybe the end of the year. But I applaud the Canadians for trying to do this in a clean manner while also exporting um, their LNG and their hydrogen um, energy sources. What do you think about this, Jim? Because I suppose there's like so many countries around the world trying to find a, a new way of doing things and to move away from Russian reliance. I think this is a remarkable moment. It's important not to understate it because here you have two countries which hitherto had good relations but not extraordinarily close ones. And here you have Olaf Schultz in probably, I think, this, one of the two most significant days in his short chancellorship, sealing the end of um, Angela Merkel's period of economic engagement with Russia. Because let's remember, Angela Merkel, for all the substance that she had at a difficult time, her, her organising philosophy was to civilise Russian politics through economic engagement. And today is a really significant moment in a pivot long-term pivot away from that between two centre-left governments who would feel at home politically with one another and both have a really unreliable large neighbours. Now, Germany with Russia, but also in a much more benign way, um, the Canadians will be unsettled with the prospect of President Trump returning at some point in the future. So it's a win-win for both of them, but it's part of the continuing fallout 
of the strategic catastrophic error that Putin has undertaken by invading Ukraine. Because make no mistake, nothing like this would be happening in this mm -hmm. timeline if it hadn't been for the invasion of Ukraine. God, that's an interesting concept, Ron, isn't it? Oh, 100 percent. And I, I think that's exactly right. I think this is why uh, Putin's uh, geostrategic maneuver to invade Ukraine is going to come back and hurt the Russian people, the people that you know the president ostensibly is trying to look out for. People are looking away from Russia. They're looking at Russian aggression and they're saying, we need to find other partners. We need to move away from sort of the, the detente that has taken place with Russia and the West for the last several decades. I think Russia is going to find themselves increasingly isolated uh, due to Mr. Putin's move here. Matthew, uh, you know, we're talking about Canada and Germany here, but could Canada also provide for other countries that are reliant, particularly if we think about some of those countries uh, moving over towards Russia, towards eastern Ukraine? Certainly. So uh, this is not the only energy export, uh, hydrogen energy export project that is being evaluated. Um, there are others which are in the works. So uh, we do believe and we are we are confident that, again, not in the immediate term, but mm -hmm. in the middle, longer term, uh, we can add an important diversification and security of energy to uh, many of Canada's trading partners in Europe and also in Asia. Huh. Well, we continue to watch it. Thanks so much for joining us, Matthew Klippenstein, who, of course, knows so much about hydrogen. I learned a lot as well. Right, let's move to a different topic. This month, thousands of people have descended upon the Scottish capital, Edinburgh, to see the artists, also the comedians, the theatres, also on the streets uh, for the Edinburgh Festival Fringe. But that's not the only thing that visitors are finding on the roads. This is the result of the city's bin strike. Overflowing bins and waste piled high on those streets. Waste workers launched a 12-day strike in August to negotiate for an improved pay offer. As yet, there's been no resolution. And as the action continues, residents have been asked to keep their trash indoors. Now, the strike is the first in a series planned by waste workers across Scotland. I love Scotland, I love Edinburgh, but that is really sad. Um, so we will do what we will come here for, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's not optimal. Terrible. Uh, well, they should pay the people what they're asking for. So it's the latest in a series of industrial action across the UK in recent weeks. Let's take a look. Barristers, they voted to go on an indefinite strike from the 15th of September. Until now, they've been striking on alternate weeks over pay and also working conditions. The move has already contributed to a backlog of some 60,000 cases. Last weekend, commuters in London, also further afield, had their travels disrupted by rail, bus and tube strikes on alternate days. Royal Mail workers are planning to strike on four different days across late August and September in a dispute over pay. On those days, only certain types of mail will be delivered. Jim, I think I have to turn to you first. Uh, you're in Scotland, you're in Glasgow, but no doubt I imagine people are talking about it in your city as well. Yeah, people in Glasgow often talk about Edinburgh. <laughs> that might be a bit of a joke you might have to tell our listeners around yeah, the world. <laughs> we're, only an hour, we're only an hour apart. And the most interesting thing about Edinburgh is the train the train station that gets you to Glasgow. I, but, but, I'm, I'm going to have to jump in and, of course, and say that's just your opinion. Continue. Yeah, of course. But look, seriously, the, there is a... There's a bigger challenge in the UK at the moment that our international viewers may not all be across. In the UK, um, workers have gone through a decade with no real terms increase in their salaries. And there's a lot of pent up frustration. And with inflation at 10 percent, it's not unreasonable for trade unions um, to be campaigning and arguing the case um, for higher wage increases. The problem here is, all, as is always, is the public pay the price. Now, this strike is about to spread across the whole of Scotland over the next couple of days. And I suspect what might be required is that the Scottish Government get involved. But no matter what your viewers see about Edinburgh, the friendly rivalry between Glasgow and Edinburgh, look, Scotland's still a beautiful country. Please do come and visit. But don't just visit the one city for one month. Try some other parts of this great country too.
I went up to Glasgow for the first time for COP26. I don't know what took me so long. It is beautiful. I love Edinburgh as well. They're both great. Now, what do you think though, Ron, looking at those pictures? What comes to your mind? I suppose that's not what you're thinking of when you think of lovely Edinburgh. No, it's not. I think the only happy ind individuals in this, the pictures that we saw were those seagulls that uh -huh. seem to be themselves <laughs> quite significantly. But the important thing here is we're seeing this around the world, right? Inflation's going up. Wage growth is not keeping track with the rate of inflation. So I think across Western Europe, you see it in Scotland, you could very well start seeing this here in the United States of if you can't pay me a livable wage um, to keep pace with inflation, we're going to have to take matters in our own hand, and that could include being out on strike. So I think what we see in Scotland could be just the beginning of a wave. Do you think that it could be effective, Ron? Well, look, I'm a free market guy, so I, I think it depends where. I think if you are in here in the United States, if you're in a city that the unions have a, a big amount of power um, with the state legislatures or the cities or the city councils, yes, I do. If you're in a right to work state that is not unionized, I don't think it would be nearly as effective. Uh, very briefly, I just have about 20 seconds. Jim, do you think this will work? I think it can do. And post COVID, I think people might want the economy to be organised a little differently and a, a good deal fairer. I think they're on about 20,000 a year. The waste workers, just to give a, a sense, of course, it's up or down depending on where they are in that pay scale, but just approximately. OK, more to come. We're going to be live in Miami as Florida's voters decide on who will win the upcoming elections and also why cry, dogs cry tears of joy when owners return home. All coming up on The Compost.